Well, good morning and welcome to the second conference on cell and gene therapy for HIV cure. We're very excited to have everyone here. As many of you know, we held uh, the first version of this conference last year and really got a lot of uh, positive feedback. So we've decided to uh, continue on with this. And if it continues to go well, we uh, hope we can uh, host everyone back here in the near future. This is a really exciting conference. We've got some cutting edge science and really some of the leaders in the field speaking today. So it'll be a very exciting, but also packed agenda. I'd like to welcome back uh, 12 members uh, from the community advisory boards from the three Martin Delaney collaboratories. And I don't know if everybody's up quite so early in the morning yet, but we uh, do have representatives from the Collaboratory of AIDS Researchers for Eradication, that's CARE. Um, and, and that's located at the University of North Carolina and in and, and, uh, collaborating institutions. The Delaney AIDS Research Enterprise, DARE, uh, from UCSF, and then our own Delaney Cell and Genome Engineering Initiative, or Defeat HIV. Uh, the community groups worked together last night and had a very uh, entertaining community event. We'd like to thank Dr. Baltimore and Dr. Cannon uh, for participating for about two hours uh, of just kind of feedback about um, where does the field stand right now and how does that affect folks in community and answer their questions and really get the word out. So a, a lot of fun. We were privileged to have Timothy Brown there again last year. Uh, all of you will know him, uh, as well as other participants in some of the exciting gene and therapy trials we'll hear about today. So it was an exciting event and, and I hope uh, many of you participated. Um, in session six, at the end of the day, we'll hear from some of the community uh, folks, uh, their perspective on what we're doing, uh, and I think that'll be one of the highlights of the day. I also want to mention in terms of uh, one of the goals of this is to forward our trainees and, and, and make sure that this field of cure research moves forward. So we have 52 scientific trainees. Uh, in the field of uh, gene and cell therapy for HIV cure and another 29 students uh, who are also participating in parts of the conference. And they come from a variety of programs that I won't go through all of them. But all the students will have a chance to have lunch with Dr. Baltimore today. And again, we're gracious for his, uh, <laughs> you were unaware of this apparently. <laughs> that was quite a response. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so they'll be able to have lunch with Dr. Baltimore, we hope. <laughs> They're looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you in advance for doing that, Dr. Baltimore. Uh, uh, lastly, I want to take a chance just to thank all of our uh, sponsors and those who supported this conference, without whom this really would not be possible. Our platinum sponsors are Amphar, Gilead, and Sangamo. We're grateful for that. And our silver sponsors include uh, Calimune, Life Technologies, Milteni Biotech, and Sigma Aldrich. So thank you to all, all of you who supported this meeting. Okay, so we have a, 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 an exciting day that's a, a really about to begin. Just a couple of last housekeeping items. Um, if you didn't get any breakfast or coffee, it'll be right outside and the coffee will be going for a little while more. Uh, and, and so help yourself with that. Lunch will be next door in what we call the B-Suites number of rooms. You may remember last year that's this direction to your right as you go out of, of the um, auditorium. For the students who want to meet with Dr. Baltimore, that'll be in the Z conference room. That's spelled S-Z-E, and that's just down this direction, about 30 meters, and you'll see it just past the waterfall, and, and, and we'll have folks to help direct you to that area. Um, dinner tonight will be at the Space Needle. Um, please join us. Uh, we would love to have you there. Shuttles will be lining up just outside the entrance to this building, probably where you came in, uh, at 630. If the weather's nice, for those of you who want to walk, it's a brisk 20 to 25 minute walk, um, but you're welcome to do so and, and join us there. Um, there's a map in your book, but if you just look up as you're outside the building, you can, from most places, <laughs> see the Space Needle uh, and go there. Restrooms are down this way again, sort of behind the Z conference room, um, kind of behind the uh, security desk as you came in. Uh, if you have any questions about that or anything else, just ask one of us or the folks at the front desk and we'll get you there. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, my co-PI uh, for David HIV, Hans Peter Kiem, and my co-organizer for this meeting, who will give you a little bit of an overview of what's going on here in Seattle in terms of HIV cure. Hans Peter. Well, thanks, Keith, and uh, also welcome to our second um, conference now, and as you can see, our 
focus here is cell and gene therapy for HIV uh, cure. And what I thought I'd do is just give you a little bit of background how this all came about. Uh, many of you know uh, this was really initiated in part, and I'll talk about the other part, but in part by Martin Delaney. And here's just a little bit of background about Martin Delaney, who is uh, founding director and pu the public voice, really, of the uh, project Inform. Um, Martin Delaney, the Martin Delaney collaboratories are named after uh, uh, Martin Delaney uh, because of his leadership and his efforts to put in place funding and structures to support uh, innovative therapies, just probably like uh, gene therapy, cell and gene therapy. Unfortunately, he died of liver cancer in uh, January of 2009, and actually at the same year, uh, the Timothy Brown uh, experience uh, was published in the New England Journal, so long-term control of HIV by uh, CCR5 Delta 32 stem cell transplantation. Uh, that came out the same year, and then in June of 2010, NIH announced new research funding for Cure Research for the first time. Uh, in July of 2011, then NIH announced three collaboratories. Uh, this is really the foundation of, of our research back uh, here in Seattle, at least the Cure research. So just you'll probably hear about this a bit more, and Timothy is actually in town. I'm not sure whether he's in the audience yet. Uh, I'm sure he will join us a bit later today. So uh, here's just very briefly uh, the, uh, the history. So Timothy was living in Berlin. He was HIV positive and developed acute myeloid leukemia. Um, they identified, fortunately, the CCR5 Delta 32 homozygous bone marrow donor. He received then chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy, uh, an allergen egg transplant, and then never went back on um, art therapy. And now more than eight years, I believe, uh, he, he remains cured of HIV. And I'm sure you'll hear more about this throughout the day. So, Again, based on, in part, Martin Delaney and, I have to say again, uh, Timothy Brown and the transplant uh, story, uh, the Martin Delaney Collaboratories came about. Uh, our collaboratory here in Seattle, again, directed by Keith and myself, uh, we focus on cell and genome engineering. Uh, then there's a CARE uh, Collaboratory uh, uh, that you've just heard about as well, uh, which is uh, directed by David Margolis in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and then the DARE Collaboratory down in San Francisco, directed by Steve Deeks, uh, Mike McCune, and Rafiq Sekely. So he just uh, gives you here, we're up here in Seattle, the DARE is in San Francisco, and then uh, over here, uh, CARE in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, with uh, Dave Margolis. So there's different, there's different foci, really, among these different collaboratories. I'll talk about ours a bit more, but here just to point out, the DARE collaboratory, really, a, a big part of the DARE collaboratory is uh, to study the circumstances under which uh, reservoirs are established and how they persist for the lifetime of patients, and are they different types of immune cells that can facilitate the persistence uh, of uh, such reservoirs. So that's a big focus of the DARE collaboratory. Then the CARE collaboratory, in North Carolina, they're really interested in activation of the latent virus pool and combined then with antiretroviral drugs, uh, the host immune response and other targeted strategies. So you've probably heard about this as the shock and kill approach. Our collaboratory here in Seattle, again, Defeat HIV, uh, the major objectives were understanding now what contributed to the cure uh, in, in, in Timothy Brown's transplant and then using gene editing to establish you know, an HIV-resistant blood and immune system, and using gene targeting also to eradicate any existing viral reservoirs uh, in patients. So the idea is that it would build, when we started this, of our extensive history in transplantation. As you can see, we've got more than 50 years of history of successful blood and stem cell transplantation to treat cancer, genetic, and infectious diseases here in Seattle. In fact, the first dis uh, description and publication of transplantation uh, was now more than uh, 50 years ago, almost 60 years ago now, by uh, Don Thomas, intravenous infusion of bone marrow in patients receiving radiation and chemotherapy. And obviously for this work, most of you know, Don, uh, and, uh, Don Thomas and Joseph Murray received the Nobel Prize in 1990, uh, again for their discoveries concerning organ and cell transplantation in the treatment of human disease. Uh, here in Seattle, obviously Don pioneered and developed uh, bone marrow transplantation. Uh, and incidentally, uh, both um, Don and Joseph Murray uh, died in 2012, the same year, almost the same age. Uh, 
Okay, so we thought here in Seattle we'd like to build upon this, our vast experience in stem cell transplantation. Uh, we'd like to understand the allogeneic part that we've just talked about, but also make it more available to mo more patients by using the patient's own stem cells. And this is a big part of our collaboratory, the idea really that we could now collect the patient's own stem cells, uh, use vector-mediated gene transfer or nucleases for CCR5 disruption, make the blood stem cells resistant to HIV, uh, but also use nuclease-mediated strategies to, to eliminate any integrated virus uh, in you know, the blood cells, uh, ex vivo, so outside here, outside of the body, but also potentially uh, in patients. Now, with that, when we take the cells, another part of the overall strategy here for stem cell transplantation obviously would be great if we can now expand uh, these genetically engineered uh, hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, because uh, we do believe that this would then also facilitate the engraftment of these cells. The more cells we have on this side, really the less conditioning we will need uh, for these cells to successfully engraft in patients. And then we've also been working on ways to, if once the cells are in, uh, engrafted, transplanted into patients, then how can we actually uh, increase the number of genetically modified cells in patients? That has also been a big research strategy of our group here in Seattle. With that, I'd just like to introduce some of the faces, this, uh, how we started out uh, our collaboratory in Seattle. Again, Keith and I uh, were uh, uh, developing this uh, program and directing, are directing this program. We've got investigators from the University of Washington here with Jim Mullins and Roger Bumgarner. Uh, we also, and uh, Shulak Hugh, uh, we work with NIH, Taewok uh, Chun, uh, the City of Hope, John Rossi. Uh, and then uh, he and uh, the Fred Hutch, also Ann Wolfrey, and the industry partner for this collaboratory uh, is uh, Sangamo with uh, Mike Holmes and uh, originally uh, Philip Gregory. We've expanded the team, so you'll uh, also see some new faces. Nikki Klatt has come on, uh, and uh, Leslie Key now also in Seattle. Uh, and we've also uh, started collaboration with the DARE Collaboratory with Rafiq Sekali and the CARE Collaboratory with Angela Kashuba. Uh, and uh, Paula has also joined our collaboratory uh, a couple of years back now. So the goals for the conference here is really bringing together investigators working on cure for HIV. There's a particular focus for us on cell and gene therapy uh, approaches to cure for HIV cure efforts. And then we hope now there's discussion about current limitations, obstacles, and novel ways to overcome them. That leads me into the agenda for our first day, just to give you a brief overview. So you'll hear, hear next here from uh, Jerome Zach about a little bit about the history and pursuit of an HIV cure. I think maybe some of his personal uh, aspects. Um, and then we'll talk about stem cell transplantation. There's three speakers in that session. Uh, Richard Ambinder, uh, Timothy Hendridge, and Leslie Keane. Then you'll hear uh, about David Baltimore, our keynote speaker. And uh, then we'll move into the gene editing session and then uh, other novel uh, therapies with CAR T cell uh, studies. And then later uh, th this afternoon, uh, the cure uh, strategies or cure uh, aspects in the community. What I'd like to highlight, as you've already heard, at 11.30, there will be a lunch with the students, with Dr. Baltimore, and we're going to be located just down uh, here down the hall, and we'll help you find that room for the students. And I think with this, uh, I'd like to, uh, we won't go into this, I'd like to stop and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Jerry Zach. Uh, most of you know him, and he will now first talk about the, um, his personal, probably, uh, impressions about cure in HIV. Well, thank you, Hans-Peter. Can people hear me? Generally, my voice dies when I'm just about ready to talk. So, <clears throat> so um, Keith and Hans-Peter asked me to give a kind of personal perspective on uh, 
HIV cure research and, and the history behind what's happening. So as a, as a modest guy, I of course chose to start off with one of my papers. Um, so I first got into the world of, of HIV latency um, back, back in 1990. And we, we found that there was a, a very labile, uh, short-lived latent form in resting T cells, which is kind of cool. We developed new technologies and gave people one of the first looks at latency in primary cells, except it really was not a stable reservoir. So it, it doesn't really have that much um, relevance to the current uh, long-term reservoirs that we have on antiretroviral therapy. So really where, where this field got started was when investigators such as David Ho and George Shaw started studying um, viral and cell dynamics in HIV-infected patients put on antiretrovirals. So this was in the middle of the 1990s. <clears throat> and originally the idea was you'd put them on a single antiretroviral, um, for example, nevirapine, and you would get a, a large, this is a two order of magnitude drop in viral load, which is great. CD4 cells rebounded. Um, and this allowed the uh, replication of the virus to stop infecting cells. That caused the cells to stop producing virus. And one could re uh, learn how quickly cells died and how quickly virus was cleared. So a lot of data on kinetics and, and how the virus replicates and destroys cells was obtained. This is really the first solid evidence that well, there was some argument whether HIV actually killed CD4 cells or not in the field at the time, and, and these studies really put that to rest. But they also determined that there was a half-life of infected cells of a little less than a day, and that virions themselves get cleared in a matter of a few hours. So this was pretty exciting, but didn't really lead to reservoirs yet. Uh, what was found, though, is that um, if the patient stayed on that single antiretroviral therapy, they eventually would develop, and actually quite quickly, would develop resistance. So the, the single drug therapies were not quite efficacious. <clears throat> what then came on a little bit later in time is the use of combination antiretrovirals, including back then uh, two uh, reverse transcription inhibitors and uh, brand new protease inhibitors. And we, they, the investigators found very nice drops in, in viral DNA um, and a slight shift in kinetics. So notice that there's a difference in the kinetics of that particular curve, which suggested the loss of two different types of reservoir cells, these probably being T cells and these may be more macrophage uh, myeloid lineage cells. Um, viral loads dropped to the limit of detection on this combination of antiretroviral therapy. Patients, of course, felt much better and, and did much better. And it led um, uh, David Ho and others to predict that if there was no other reservoir, okay, that you could eradicate this disease in two to three years. Now, David got a lot of grief for that, but he did say if there was no other reservoir. He didn't know there were other reservoirs at the time. We now know there's a long-term reservoir, so we don't have eradication in two to three years, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, <clears throat> but it still made for, for it was a, a really a defining event in the field that you could actually bring that viral load down to undetectable levels. But as we, as we said, reservoirs do persist, even though the virus is undetectable. But this did lead to, um, a slew of papers looking at more detailed kinetics, more about what's going on with HIV disease, and in fact um, led to David being uh, named Time Man of the Year in um, 1996. Now, for those of you who were at a Keystone meeting right around that time, there's another investigator, John Moore, who was at the same institution as David, Aaron Diamond, and he showed up at Keystone with a pair of sunglasses painted to look exactly like this. <laughs> I, I don't know how well he could see, but uh, it, was, it was pretty cute. Uh, yeah. So, so David got Man of the Year really as a representative of the entire AIDS research community. Um, possibly singling out David as the, as the, the only one. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to give an opinion. <laughs> but um, he was the figurehead at the time, uh, seeing how, how great this advance was. But this advance, the use of uh, combination antiretroviral therapy and the, the, the dramatic drop in viral load, really allowed um, Deanna Finzi and Bob Silicano to do this landmark study, um, which really defined the fact that there was a latent reservoir in uh, resting memory CD4 T cells that could be long-lived. So the reservoir can be, you can't see these cells, but you can detect them by taking them out of the body, putting them in limiting dilution culture with indicator cells and stimulating them um, and rescuing virus out of those cells. And by that means you can quantitate um, how much activation inducible virus is present in the reservoir. Um, so follow-up studies allowed the Silicon lab to 
to study the level of this reservoir and the stability of this reservoir. So this is some of the earlier studies uh, showing eight patients for up to eight years, um, looking at the number of activation-inducible or latent cells in the peripheral blood. And the take-home message is the, the numbers vary a little bit. Actually, there's about a two-order magnitude difference between the lowest and the highest, maybe even more than that, uh, difference in the, the number of reservoir cells. Um, but the take-home message is it's about one per million resting CD4 cells are latently infected, at least by this assay. The other take-home message is the slope of this decay, assuming there is no other turnover of the reservoir. Now, I think there is probably some reservoir turnover and reseeding, um, but it's not a massive amount. But if you assume there's no turnover based on these data, um, the half-life of that reservoir is uh, 44 months, which equates to it's going to take over 70 years to completely eliminate the reservoir on heart. Right? So that's not tenable if you want to eliminate the disease. Right? So people are now working on ways to get rid of this reservoir, either by immune modulation or, or purging or what have you. Um, but it's, it's pretty clear that uh, we have a stable long-term reservoir that we need to deal with. There may be more than one reservoir. This is just the major one that we're aware of in resting CD4 memory T cells. <clears throat> so a few years later, uh, Tae Wook Chung, who actually was a graduate student in Silicon's lab, then moved to the NIH with Tony Fauci subsequently, um, did some studies in patients trying to um, drop reservoirs by adding interleukin-2 uh, to the patient. And they actually found that they could drop viral load to where they couldn't even detect it in these limiting dilution assays. So they, they, they really did bring the reservoir down. But if they took the patients off at antiretroviral therapy, they almost immediately got a rebound in viremia. So even though they could impact the reservoir, um, it was still there at some level. So what this really showed us is you can affect the reservoir, but it's going to take a lot more than we originally thought in, uh, in 1999. Um, so then my lab, you know, you'll notice there's a 13-year time span between when I said I did two things. Um, but in 2003, I, we did what probably amounts to the first uh, shock and kill approach. Um, which we called activation elimination. And we did it using a, an old-style humanized mouse model. We took human cells out of these humanized mice, and we knew there were latently infected cells in this pool. We stimulated them with either a cytokine interleukin-7 or with a 4-ball ester called prostratin, which I'll talk about more tomorrow. We could activate those cells. And then we came in with an immunotoxin that we obtained through collaborations with Ed Berger and others at the NIH. And this immunotoxin is basically an antibody molecule with a toxin hooked to it. Um, the antibody directed the toxin to the cells now induced to make virus, and it rapidly killed them. So this made pretty good um, popularity in the lay press. In fact, it hit the front page of the New York Times uh, science section. This is what I looked like in 2003. Um, <laughs> I didn't have hair then either. Um, that, in fact, fell out as soon as I got married, but that's a different story. Um, so anyway, this hit. It was pretty popular in the lay press, but the scientific community didn't latch onto it back then. They weren't ready to try to cure HIV. Um, and part of the reason for that was that there was a companion article right next to this in the New York Times about a ladder into space. Um, now, I don't think they've gotten there yet, as far as I know. We might have gotten further on cure than they did on this ladder into space. But, but notice that the, the headline for the ladder into space says, not science fiction. Okay, it doesn't say that for this. So. Uh, you know, we, we, everything was against us at the time. So um, bottom line, things have, have progressed. Um, people are more excited about cure. But we really did start out doing this um, many, many, many years ago, trying to do shock and kill. Or at, at that time, we called it activation elimination. All right, so moving on, probably the biggest thing that happened in the field was uh, Timothy Brown, the Berlin patient, and his apparent cure of HIV disease. Um, this has been alluded to already, and it'll probably be alluded to more. In, uh, in this meeting, but just to bring you up to speed in case you don't know, and you've been living under a rock for a while, um, HIV needs to bind two receptors in order to enter cells. It needs to bind CD4, shown here, and it needs to bind a co-receptor. And the, the most uh, well-used co-receptor, and certainly the receptor used uh, in, in cells in virus transmitted sexually is CCR5. The other one is uh, CXCR4. But you need to bind this co-receptor in order for the virus to actually start initiating the fusion process. Um, there's a population of northern Europeans, about 1% of northern Europeans, that are deleted for both alleles of the CCR5 gene. It's a 32 base pair deletion that frame shifts the gene so that the protein is not made, it's not functional. 
um, and these uh, individuals don't have any CCR5. So that basically means the virus that's tropic for this co-receptor can't get in. So, so Timothy um, was HIV positive and also developed leukemia. He underwent aggressive chemotherapy to clear the leukemia, uh, and this required um, uh, lots of chemotherapy. It required total body radiation and many, many other manipulations, as well as two uh, bone marrow transplants. But the bone marrow donor was closely matched by HLA type and also came from a, a CCR5 Delta 32 homozygous individual. So basically, the, the cells didn't have C, uh, CCR5. So Timothy was transplanted. Now, along this transplant procedure, there was also what's known as graft versus host disease. So the transplanted cells attacked Timothy cells as well. So it's probably a combination of the ablation treatment he's had, the um, uh, GVH that he had, as well as the fact that his cells are now refractory to infection that led to this, uh, what looks like a cure um, eight years later. So why can't we use this approach for everybody? Well, chemotherapy and bone marrow transplant pr procedure was, was very risky, and you'll hear more about these down the road. And Timothy had uh, many problems with this, and he can tell you about that. I'm assuming he's going to be here later on in this meeting. Um, matching donors are very difficult to find. Um, in fact, this, these Delta 32s are really found only in the Caucasian population, so other races and ethnicities may be harder to match um, due to HLA typing. The procedure is very expensive and time-consuming, requires excellent medical, medical facilities, which is not really feasible in, in many parts of the, of the developing world. And the patient will have to take immunosuppressives to prevent him from re, um, rejecting the, the new tissue or from that tissue um, rejecting his, um, his tissues as well. So it really can't be a generalized um, therapy. So we need to find better approaches to do this. But that led to Dr. Heinrich, who's going to be speaking later to this morning, I believe, and probably tell you more about this, to study whether GVH was contributing to um, this ability to cure Timothy. And so basically the Boston patients received allogeneic transplants uh, from cells that were not deleted for CCR5. So it was really looking at just the GVH aspect. And um, initially it was thought that these patients might have been cured because they went off antiretrovirals for a period of time and were fine. Um, but the, re the HIV rebounded back, and again, you'll hear more about this, but um, they were HIV positive and also developed leukemia. They underwent reduced intensity chemo to, to clear the leukemic cells. Um, they were on antiretrovirals at the time. Uh, they then received a bone marrow transplant. Again, the cells were not resistant to HIV. They still expressed CCR5. They stayed on antiretroviral therapy for several years. The virus was no longer detectable. They then had treatment interruption, and they stayed um, virus, apparently virus-free for quite some time, um, three and eight months, but both ended up rebounding. So in these particular patients, the GVH that was seen was not sufficient to clear the virus, but it did drop the reservoir enough that there was at least some remission effect um, after uh, withdrawing ART. So that's telling us something about the reservoir. You can impact it. You can um, affect Normally when you go off of antiretroviral therapy, the viral rebound will, will occur within two weeks. So the fact that you can go three months and eight months afterwards is, is quite astonishing, actually. So there is an impact on the reservoir. It just not, did not fully destroy it. Um, another exciting happening a few years ago was uh, a child known as the Mississippi baby. Um, so this is what I love about medical technology and medical writing. So an infant was born by spontaneous vaginal delivery at 35 weeks of gestation to a woman. Now, if I was writing this, okay, I would say an infant was born to a woman. You know what I mean? I mean okay? But the bottom line is the, the subject received... Um, intensive uh, triple ART within 30 hours of birth, okay? Virus load was detected at least for, oh, for a few days, right? Um, the patient received the therapy for uh, a few months. I have a graph here. So triple therapy for 20 months or so, and then was lost to follow-up that basically left the clinic and came back <clears throat> several months later, basically no um, detectable virus. So it was really exciting. Everybody thought this, this patient was actually cured, um, but Sadly, about two years later, the virus rebounded. But again, what this says, at least in this one pediatric patient, if you impact the formation of the reservoir early with triple therapy, you can lower, not eliminate completely, but lower that reservoir so that when those cells get reactivated, it takes a much longer time for that virus to come out. Um, 
so this was about a two-year time span um, off of, as far as we know, off of drug and, uh, and no detectable viral load. <clears throat> in the late rebound cases of this, ba this baby and the Boston patients basically proved that HIV can persist in the latent form for years and then replicate again. It also tells us we can impact that reservoir. Okay, and I think that's the good news is we can do things to impact the reservoir. We just haven't completely cured it yet. Um, there's a second baby uh, known as the LA baby that had a similar, well, not quite so similar, but analogous history. Um, this child was treated four hours after birth with um, hardcore uh, ART, has not been taken off of antiretrovirals yet, but apparently has no detectable viral load. So maybe there's another child that um, is in the same situation, but we won't know until this child goes off of ART. Another group of, of patients called the Visconti cohort in Paris, which stands for, I love these, Bioimmunologic Sustained Control After Treatment Interruption. Um, these patients received um, very early treatment with ART and basically look like they have a functional cure. Um, this is observed in this cohort in about 15% of patients, which is higher than what people originally thought would happen. Um, but basically, this is showing you viral load and CD4 count of these 14 patients. It's almost impossible to see this, but what you can see at some stage, there's some red dots. This is where viral load becomes detectable. So these guys have really undetectable viral load, but on occasion, um, a little burst of, of virus. So they're not cured, but they're in long-term uh, remission. So again, there's um, hope that we can impact reservoirs to keep at least some patients in a remissive state. Um, and now people who are at cure meetings are talking about, um, cure is a great word, but it may be difficult to obtain. If you can obtain a significant remission, that would be great too. So we're working towards a cure, but we're also working towards these long-term remissions. Okay, so <clears throat> residual virus on ART limits definitive treatment or cure of HIV disease. So where do the reservoir cells reside? Um, they can reside in lately infected resting memory T cells, like I mentioned before, at siliconals work. There's about one, million, uh, one per million cells in the blood, although I'll show you in a second. The, the estimate now is a little higher than this. Um, there can be residual replication deep in tissues that, where antiretrovirals may not penetrate. So some people think there's a percolating reservoir as well as a latent reservoir. And this, of course, if you went off a drug, would, be, would allow uh, rekindling of viremia. Um, groups here and, uh, and in Washington have shown that you can infect a self-renewing type cell and get some clonal expansion of HIV, which could be another uh, new type of reservoir. And there may be other reservoirs in the brain or other non-T cell types that are less abundant and we know less about. Um, but if we chip away systematically at all the reservoirs, we'll probably find some others that we need to eliminate. But the bottom line is we're going to have to eliminate all of these or at least control all these types of reservoirs to affect a cure, even um, a functional cure. So I alluded to this uh, a second ago, but, but Bob Silicon has been doing some additional studies of the size of the latent reservoir. And uh, what he's done in a series of patients, and these sphere, half spheres represent the size of the reservoir. This is the amount, the relative, it's obviously not a number, but the relative amount of HIV proviral DNA you can find in patients' blood um, by PCR. Most of the proviral DNA in patient cells are defective, okay? And we've known that for, for decades. Um, Bob's initial assay was using a viral outgrowth assay where you do limiting dilution and stimulate the cell and see what type of virus you can get out. And that showed a very, very small number of activation-inducible viruses, about one in a million cells, okay? Um, what Bob's done more recently is he's actually sequenced the DNA of the proviruses that didn't come out of the latent reservoir, and he's found that a lot of them are actually fully intact, okay? They're not mutated, they're not deleted. And so that means that the potential reservoir um, is larger. And so this blue half-sphere, hemisphere, or whatever you want to call it, is the potentially replication competent virus that isn't mutated um, in those cells. Well, what he's been able to do is do um, sequestive, se so now there's 62 fold more virus that might be functional in the reservoir than we originally thought. What Bob's done is uh, sequential stimulations now of reservoir cells. And so what he sees at some point, he gets some act activity, got latency coming out, some cells do not. If he re-stimulates those cells, he gets a subset of them being reactivated, and if he re-stimulates again, he gets another subset of those being reactivated. So 
more virus can come out than we originally thought if you do successive um, activation events, and we don't understand why that happens. But basically, it's led Bob to conclude that the truly inducible reservoir is bigger than what he originally thought. Um, it may not be as big as the um, quote, quote, sequence functional uh, proviral DNA, but it's, it's more than we thought it was, which is uh, bad news, but uh, still not insurmountable. It also tells us that if you use successive signaling, you might be able to whittle away at this, at this reservoir. So, so basically, what, what I'm trying to get to you is it's diff very difficult to find latently infected cells. They're at an incredibly low frequency, so they're in about one per million, which if you think about the size of the Rose Bowl, and I look, like to do this because we have some people from USC here, and UCLA plays <coughs> at the Rose Bowl. And I think we beat, what, didn't we beat you the last few years? In a row? <laughs> Quite handedly, I might. I'm just saying. Uh, anyway, it, <laughs> yeah, I, I was a quarterback. I deflated the balls. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's like finding a needle in a haystack, right? It's equivalent to finding a single person in 11 Rose Bowls. Um, so there, these are very infrequently found, and so we have, to, we have to have some pretty cool technology to actually find them. And if you have kids, it's, it's a bit like playing Pokemon because you've you got to catch them all to get rid of the reservoir. You can't even have one of these cells left or the reservoir is going to come back. So how can we eliminate or control HIV reservoirs? Well, a lot of people at this conference are working on, on different ways to do this. Um, we can excise the proviral genome with targeted nucleases. Keith mentioned that, and, and his group up in Seattle is doing work like that. We can enhance immune responses either by vaccines or engineered T cells using broadly neutralizing antibodies. There's going to be talks about this. Dr. Baltimore will talk about his genetic, I think, your uh, gene therapy with broadly neutralizing antibodies, which I think I'll go on record as an exciting potential. Um, we can even enhance the immune response via genetic manipulation of stem cells by introducing uh, uh, chimeric antigen receptors that would allow these cells to become killer T cells. Um, we can replace the stem cell compartment with genetically protected cells. Um, that's actually what happened to, to Timothy, except his was not a genetically manipulated stem cell. Um, but, but Dr. Cannon will talk about CCR5 modulation with seeing fingers. The Calamine group and others will talk about CCR5 modulation with, um, with uh, RNAs that, that cleave the CCR5 RNA molecule, as well as the second therapy, C46. Um, people have tried ribozymes. I've already introduced you to shock and kill, but I'll give a talk tomorrow about uh, shock and kill approaches that are, uh, that, are, that are now becoming more popular, if you will. Um, I talked to you about the um, Mississippi baby. There's now another, uh, was a pediatric case in, in Paris um, that received early antiretroviral therapy. And I don't think this is published yet, but it, it's, it was released at the... Um, IAS meeting a few weeks ago in Vancouver, but this patient's now 18 years of age and has been off antiretrovirals for 12 years and um, doesn't have viral load. So there's another pediatric case that had a, what looks like a long remission. So very inten early intensive therapy may halt formation of the reservoir, which I think would be very exciting, especially in pediatric populations. And there's now people looking at small molecules that actually interact with TAT which is a transactivator for HIV, which will prevent reactivation or really send the virus into deep latency. So it's actually the opposite of shock and kill. We're trying to get the virus out of the latent reservoir. Here they're trying to just make it go deeper in the reservoir so it, so it never comes out. So there's multiple strategies that one can use. Each has advantages and disadvantages, and I'm sure that all, many of them will be discussed further on in this meeting. Um, so what, what I want to um, get across to the lay people is you'll see lots of things in headlines, okay? They don't always tell the story because this is a scientist trying to tell the correct story that he killed 10% of tumor cells in a rat and the paper then says the cancer was cured, which 90% of the tumor cells that were in the tail were still there and who knows where else they were in the mouse. In addition, um, other headlines could mislead you. Um, I don't think soy sauce is really gonna cure HIV. Uh, bee venom, not bloody likely either. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I just, just if you're in the community and you read stuff, go to a reputable source and, 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 and follow up on that because not everything you read in the, in the lay press is going to be true. Actually, not everything you read in the scientific literature is going to be true either. <laughs> About half, but uh, yeah, not intentionally. Okay, so just to conclude, because I know you're going to try to kick me off of the stage pretty soon. Um, 
HIV cure research is a major focus of the scientific community um, now in the last few years. Uh, probably for the last four or five years, it's been pretty hot. Um, it's hard to definitively prove that a person is cured. You have to take them off of therapy, and then they have to wait for maybe years to see if they're actually cured. Um, and that runs with some risk, because now they're off of therapy. Um, there is one case now uh, where a person does appear to be cured, and that's Timothy. There's several other cases where there's long-term remission, uh, which essentially is a functional cure, although those patients may be able to transmit. Um, if you actually truly eliminate everything, there would be no transmission event possible. Um, the circumstances of Timothy, Timothy's cure are highly unusual. So it's bone marrow transplant with resistant cells and lots of chemotherapy and other types of therapy to remove his pre-existing immune system. And, and so therefore, that approach can't be directly apl applied to all infected people. In fact, it's, it's very toxic, so we don't really recommend that approach unless it's needed for the leukemia. Um, but the case is very important. It's a proof of concept that you can cure HIV disease. Um, more studies are being performed to identify what happened in Timothy's case, and Keith alluded to that, alluded to that uh, earlier this morning, um, and to try to replicate it in a safe manner. And one way to do that is to eliminate CCR5 from cells and give the patient back their own cells. In that case, there will not be a GDH component, though. So whether that would contribute to the cure or not, it's a little un unclear. And I, I listed a bunch of new strategies which people are testing to eliminate HIV. And I, I didn't think I had time to go through all the advantages and disadvantages, but you'll probably hear those discussed um, later on in the meeting. So I'll pretty much stop here and take questions if we have time. But I wanted to, um, oh, my, my acknowledgment slide is not coming up. Um, but what I want to acknowledge is um, Bob Silicano from Hopkins and Matt Marsden from UCLA who gave me some slides because I am not capable of making those animated slides that you saw. Which one? Oh, wrong keyboard. See, I did have it. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to thank Bob um, and, and Matt for sharing slides and uh, for helpful conversations on, on what, what areas to go with, with this talk, which uh, I had fun giving. So thank you very much. Do you have Are there any questions? Yeah, so, so it, it, uh, currently on, on antiretroviral therapy, it's, it takes forever to deplete, right? So the, the strategies people are taking now it, it, to try to shock and kill is to hit everything that you can right off the bat while the patient's still on ART, so it prevent further spread. I think what we're going to have to use is combination um, triggering um, and multiple triggering events based on Bob's data to... Um, to actually eliminate those, those cells. So it's going to take, even in the best case scenario, several weeks of treatment to try to purge these reservoirs at the best case scenario. Um, it may take years. Um, we're hoping that's not the case. But I, I, I have a bias, obviously, or I wouldn't be doing this kind of stuff. But I think if we can find better purging strategies, build up the immune system with potentially vaccine approaches, Dr. Baltimore's neutralizing antibody approach, get everything on board, and then start purging reservoirs, you have a much better chance of not reseeding after you purge, and then you'll start eliminating reservoirs. I, I hope that answered your question. Well, I was asking more about the natural course of decay of the reservoir, uh, whether we know that it is an exponential decay or whether there might be some other processes that change its shape and would be more open. Right. So people, so the original premise was the reservoir did not get reseeded. So what you saw was just a steady decline, um, a linear decline with a very, very slow half-life. What's probably happening is there's more, more turnover than was originally thought, and there's some reseeding back in the reservoir, and the viral load might play a part of that. As you drop viremia, you drop killing of cells, you drop some turnover, you drop reseeding as well. So, but the bottom line, there seems to be a nearly steady state with very, very slow elimination of the reservoir under current conditions. That's why we have to go and try to impact it with different therapeutic approaches. I do think there's some reseeding in the reservoir. I don't think it's static. Any other questions? Yeah, Paula. So, how long do you think it takes to get to, so people's reservoir levels are kind of like at a steady state, and, and it's within a sort of quite narrow uh, 
for that individual, yeah. Yeah, so um, the reservoir gets seeded within a few, so once you get viremia, right, the peak viremia and, and, and resolution of that, you've seeded your reservoir. It, it may not, and again, it's not static. So uh, Bob had a uh, recent paper <clears throat> where he looked at re resistance mutations in reservoir cells, okay? If you looked at patients that had been on drug for a while, they had resistant mutations in the reservoir to the original drugs. So that means those guys evolved after therapy, which is subsequent to, subsequent to acute viremia, okay? So you can, you can see the reservoir during, during acute viremia, but it's not only seated during acute viremia. And so that's why I'm saying I think it's not static because the fact that you can get drug-resistant virus in the reservoir suggests that the reservoir is seated after drug. Does that make sense? I probably am not, I'm sounding confused, but I know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> Rafiq? It's pretty constant. It's, it's almost established very early in the infection at TB3 or within the first 10 days of acute cell infection. Yeah, it, it's a very constant level, but I think there's some dyna dy oh, yeah. dynamic exchange within the reservoir. Yeah, but it stays pretty stable. Yeah. Okay. I think we should move on. Thank you.